Amen. Amen. I'm super excited to be with you all tonight. This is so exciting. Um, the last time I preached, I was preaching to a camera, so this is even more exciting. Hey, guys, maybe turn to your neighbor, say hello. Wave at them. Say, I'm so glad to see you. Turn to your other neighbor, if you have one. <laughs> Um, but yes, I am on staff here, and I am so excited to be with you tonight. So we are in week three of our Come Alive series. Week one, Pastor AJ kicked it off with uh, God is life, and a word that I cannot pronounce, but I will try. I did, did I do it? Wow, I did it, which means the breath of God. Um, so week one, what he said is that the Spirit of God... Oh, the word of God releases the spirit of God to accomplish the work of God, which is a powerful thing to think about. One word from God, what it can do in our lives. Week two was Pastor Tellus, the firebomb himself, <laughs> came through with a word called viral revival about what it looks like to live revived as according to Acts 2.42. And tonight... I am here to bring a word, which, yeah, come on, yeah. yes, <laughs> I fought for this word, so I'm about to give it, okay, so, um, fun fact about me is I love to sleep. Who else loves to sleep? You can... <laughs> At the age that I am, I still love naps, praise God. I'm the middle child, so I was the one who went, who was like, I'm ready to sleep, mom. Um, you know, the oldest child is always like fighting sleep. Uh, the middle child is like, I'm whatever I want to be. And the middle child is like, put me to bed. I got to get away from these crazies. Um, but I love to sleep. And one, one of my friends sent me a meme the other day, if you can put it up. <laughs> she sent it to our group chat and she said, this is me, which is very funny. Normally my phone is dead, but it also is because I'm asleep and I don't, and my phone is on do not disturb. Um, sleep is not only enjoyable, but it's physiologically good for us, right? Um, it rests our body and our mind and allows us to recharge for the next day, be prepared and ready mentally, physically to take on whatever the next day has for us. Um, but the greatest enemies to my love of sleep are these. First one is... Do you guys know what that is? <laughs> It is your alarm clock. Um, and the second one is this. Let's see. So, <laughs> if you grew up in a um, African American home or a Caribbean home, you know what that sound on a Saturday morning means. Right? It means it's time to get up and clean this house. <laughs> So both of those sounds mean the same thing, which is it's time to get up, right? Um, if you have teenagers in the room, wave your hand if you have a teenager. Okay, yeah, there's some people who have teenagers. You know that every morning during the school year is a war. You are in a war to get them awake, bathed, fed, and to school on time. And if you were a teenager, you remember thinking when the alarm went off, why God? Why? I know I willingly stayed up to 2 a.m. in the morning talking to my friend on the phone about nothing, but that has nothing to do with this. Why am I awake? <laughs> um, and if you were in my middle school Camp Collide group, wow, they would say this to me, why are you doing this to me? Like it was a personal attack, but really it was to get them up and ready to encounter God. Um, and as dramatic as that sounds, the reality for a lot of us is that we are actually spiritually asleep. We're sleepwalking through life, have not woken up fully to the promises and the purposes of God. We're alive, but we're not awake. And uh, I feel like I have been sent here by the spirit of the living God to say, wake up. It's time to get up. It's time to pick up your mat 
and go and walk. It's time to take God at his word and live alive to the purposes and the promises of God. You know the scariest place, the place that's full of the most promise, the most dreams, the most um, everything is the cemetery. People never lived alive. They went to the grave still full of the dreams and the purposes that God had for them. And I don't want that for us. This whole series is called Come Alive, and I really do believe it's a prophetic, um, it's a prophetic thing to us as a church, to us as individuals, to us as the global church, that it really is time to wake up. And it's not just time to wake up, it's time to actively live a life for the glory of God to pour it all out on the field, to not leave anything back, to not leave one ounce of the purpose that God put in your life still left in you when you leave this planet. Amen? So why am I yelling? (laughs) Why do I feel like this is so urgent? Is because a sleeping church can never help a dying world. So I wanna spend a few moments tonight um, on this topic. So you want revival? Well, it's time to wake up. And our key verse this evening, if you have your Bibles, or it's on the screen, um, Ephesians 5, 14, and it says, this is Paul talking to the church of Ephesus. For this reason, he says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you and give you light. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful for your word. God, we are grateful for your word. If it wasn't for your word, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for your life, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for your mercy and your goodness that's poured out on us every single day, God, your word says that your mercy greets us in the morning, that we wake up to it. And so, God, we recognize your holiness, your majesty, and your goodness even in this moment. And, God, as you are urgently calling us to yourselves and calling us to be awake, God, I pray that we would hear this with ears of faith, that our hearts would be open to receive what you have to say tonight. God, would you use these words? Would they not be my words, but would they be your words, Jesus? We honor you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So sleep is an interesting thing, right? Because when you're asleep, you're alive, but you're not fully conscious. You're disconnected from your environment, um, you're basically rendered inactive. The only thing still activating is kind of those automatic things like breathing and your brain is still going, but it's not connected to what the world is around you. So when we we read this passage in Ephesians 5.14, the Apostle Paul is speaking to this very thing and he says something so astonishing. He says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead. Now, why was the Apostle Paul talking to the church? He wasn't speaking to sinners in this this passage. He was speaking to saints, church members. And these are not just like our Christmas and Easter only Christians. These are the ones who went to the Ephesus Wednesday night Bible study. (laughs) I really do laugh at my own jokes, so it's it's fine. (laughs) Um... But this isn't me saying that you need to be awake, but the world needs you to be awake. This is the world that's crying out for hope and healing, and they can't find it in themselves. If you couldn't tell from the news, all they are recreating is more death and more chaos. Because death only begets death. It can never produce life. Only supernatural life can swallow death. And that's why we need the church to be not only awake, but alive. Amen? 
Um, So A.W. Tozer says something really interesting about this passage, which I loved. He said, the Ephesians in this passage were morally good, but unenlightened. They were religious, but unanointed. It is perfectly possible for a good, faithful, loyal church member to be spiritually asleep. That's scary. So why would Paul need to be speaking to believers? Because just like Peter in the garden of Gethsemane, when we should be awake, watchful, preparing, we're asleep. We're unaware of what is happening, what the significance of the moment is, and we are totally unprepared for what is coming. That's why we need to be asleep. So what does it mean to be spiritually asleep? Last week, Pastor Tellis uh, said that we need to live revived. We need to be actively devoted to these four things that he talked about in Acts 2.42. And if you can remember, shout it out with me. So he said, one, the devotion to the word? Yes. The apostles' teaching and the word of God. He said you need to be devoted to fellowship. You need to be devoted to the breaking of bread. And you need to be devoted to prayer. Hey, hey oh, amen. <laughs> um, the character of Christ is not just head knowledge, but it has to be transformative knowledge. So I don't know, does anybody go to the gym here? Oh, yeah, awesome. I pretend to go to the gym. I wear exercise clothes like I'm about to go. (laughs) But, like, I think it's going to inspire me, you know? Like, I'm going to wear this cool outfit that I bought that matches, and I'm going to go to the gym, but I don't. Um, (laughs) um, It's like those people at the gym who are, like, are bodybuilders, and they're super top-heavy, but they have really skinny legs, (laughs) and they look crazy. But you don't want to tell them that they look crazy because that's mean um, and that's not Christ-like. But sometimes I think as Christians, we are so top-heavy. We know a lot. We sit in church every single Sunday. Maybe if you've been around Grace Covenant Church for a while, you've gotten a prophetic word. God has told you about yourself, about where you're going to go, what you're going to do, where you're going to be. And yet we don't do anything with it. We're like top-heavy but bottom skinny. We don't live out what we know. And that's what it's like to be spiritually asleep. You know a lot, but you don't do anything with what you know. Um, And I think we need to check our vital signs. So for me, those four points that Pastor Tellis um, said last week, what does your prayer life look like? This is how you can check to see if you're alive, barely alive, maybe just making it. It's <laughs> what does your prayer life look like? What does your time in the word look like? What does your fellowship look like? Are you actively remembering and revering Christ? Or maybe you're like my iPhone that says hasn't been backed up in two months. <laughs> maybe. So what the problem is with being spiritually asleep is that you are unaware of the presence of God, you're unaware to the work of God, and you're definitely unaware to the purpose of God. You have no idea what's happening, and you definitely aren't prepared for what will come. But in verse 14, we see that Paul literally puts this scripture in the middle of a huge passage. So maybe uh, later tonight or tomorrow, you can just read the whole top part of Ephesians 5, um, which talks about being imitators of Christ. So the first part is what you shouldn't do, what you shouldn't do. Then there's like this bridge, which is verse 14, and it gets to what it actually looks like to live a life imitating Christ. Um, And I love that. I love that he, he gives us a visual of what it looks like to not be imitators of Christ, not be alive. And then then he says, hey, you need to wake up to the things of God. Now this is what you should be doing. This is how you should be living. This is what you should be doing. So what does it actually mean to be awake? I think exactly what I said. Awake means you are aware to the things of God, and the Lord has opened your eyes to your identity and to the mission of God. The call to come to Jesus 
is not separated from the call to community and the call to be on the mission field for God. It makes me think of the parable of the 10 virgins um, in Matthew 25. So if you have your Bibles, you can go there or you can read this after. It's a really cool story um, that not that many people talk about actually, but uh, it's these 10 virgins, they have um, oil lamps. So it's not like our modern uh, things, but they're like glass and they have like a bulb at the bottom and that's where you hold the, the oil and then it has a wick and a candle. Um, so this, the parable is about these 10 virgins. There are five who are prepared. They are always trimming their wick. They have extra oil. They're always pouring it in. Then there's the five, which the Bible also actually calls the foolish ones. They are chilling. They're doing, they're like, I don't know when he's coming back. This whole story is about being prepared for the bridegroom to come back for the day of the Lord. So there's the five who are actively, they're awake, they're actively pursuing God, they're trimming their wake, they're getting extra oil because they don't know when he's coming back, but when he comes back, I'm gonna be ready for this party. Then you have the other ones who are foolish and they're like, what, what are, why are you running around? What you, what you doing? Chill, relax, lay down. We don't know when he's coming back and you know, he'll like give us a sign or whatever and whoa, boom, the bridegroom shows up. (laughs) <laughs> the five who are prepared are ready to go into the reception with God. They're ready to meet him. They're waiting for him at the door. The five who were foolishly taking their time, weeks, months, days, doing whatever, not pursuing Christ, not awake to him, they are literally shook. They're like running around. Their, their hair is falling out. They are asked, begging for the, the oil. Then they go off to run and look for oil and they miss out on the party. I don't want that for us. I don't. I don't want us to miss out on meeting the bridegroom and being ready for this amazing party. Being awake does not mean you're having an impact. You're just ready to get in the game. So think about this. The woman at the well, she encounters Christ. He tells her everything about her life. She has a revelation of who he actually is. What does she do? She drops her jug of water, and she runs out and grabs her friends to come and see. And she tells them, he's told me everything about who I am. He's revealed himself to me. You've got to meet this man. That's a woman who's awake and in the game. And that's what it means to be awake and in the game. So what is the light that we have? The light is the, is the hope of the gospel. Do we really believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Have we really encountered the hope of the living gospel I can share a story, um, and I probably am going to cry. I'm a crier, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> when I was 21, I, uh, they found a lump. And for every woman in this room, you're probably like, oh, my God. Um, and I was like, Lord, I'm 21. I haven't even lived life yet. I'm about to graduate. This is not, this is not fair, <laughs> to be honest. Um, And I encountered God in such a powerful way. He showed up. Thankfully, my nurses were godly women, which is a miracle in itself. Um, Before I went in, they were like, listen, I don't know you. I feel like you from your spirit and how you talk, like you are a Christian. So I just want to say to you, God is with you, that he has your back. Um, And I went in there, and thank God they didn't find anything. But... In that moment, I really had to reckon with who do I believe Jesus is? Who is he to me? If I go today, will I be with him? If I don't go today, will I know him better? Will I serve him differently? Will I seek his face? Will I run to him? Um, Those are things that I, I had to face in myself with the hope of the gospel that God has me in the palm of his hand no matter what. Whatever way it goes, I'm with God. So, and thank God I'm here. (laughs) Woo, God 
God was not done with me yet. Amen. Um, so, so how do you know uh, you are, you're available, that the light of Jesus is shining through you? The whole point of light is to illuminate the dark, right? If we turned off all the lights in this room and all you had was your iPhone light, it would sparkle, right? All you need is a little bit of light to illuminate the darkness. And some of us are in dark places and we're asking God to rescue us out of it. But what if God has actually called us to be light within it? To uncover that hope of the gospel, uncover the revelation of Christ and let that light light up the darkness. I think what the light is, is actively pursuing him. As he shines in us, he dispels the light and he dispels the darkness in us and dispels the darkness around us. And then he can shine brighter through us. Praise God. Because this world needs light. And it doesn't take a person on the stage. It, it doesn't take a person with a mic. It doesn't take a person from a pulpit. It doesn't take a person in a government position. It takes a person willing to be awakened to the Spirit of God and activated in their life in God. That's all it takes. I love this story of John Wesley and Charles Wesley. You may know, you may have heard their names. Um, John Wesley is a famous theologian. A lot of our theology and how we do church was really um, birthed in his relationship with God. And Charles Wesley was a famous hymn writer. But their mom, who is, un, I, I don't remember her name, which I think that's part of the purpose, she had 19 children which is like, what? <laughs> In itself. <laughs> Whoa. But I love the fact that she determined when she was very young, before she married their dad, that she would be a woman of prayer and she would teach her kids how to love God and how to serve God. Her, her light made an impact in her children's life, so much so that the great awakening Ooh, I get chills. <laughs> her kids got to be a part of that. We're still singing the songs of one of her kids just because of the light that she showed in her home. That they knew when she put her apron over her head, because there's 19 kids, there's nowhere to hide, <laughs> that she was going to God on their behalf. That she was seeking God's face and she was allowing him to dispel the darkness in her, in her heart, in her life, enough that it broke through to her kids' lives. And I'm so thankful that we get to be a part of that heritage. You know, we aren't Wesleys, but who knows? Yeah. Only God knows the impact that we're having in the school district and in, the pol in politics, the impact that we're having in our home life, the impact that we're having in our workplace. Yeah. This is what a little bit of light can do and imagine if we turned off all the lights and everyone in this room shined their little bit of light. Yeah. It probably would be just as bright or almost as bright as these, these can lights. But how much more beautiful would it be because it's made up of all these little individual lights that together come together and make this big beautiful light. That's a city set on a hill. So like a lighthouse, all of us together when we lift up Christ and Christ shines brighter through us, the darkness is dispelled. Those that are lost can find their way home. There's no shipwrecks, life wrecks, because we're shining the light of Christ. So in conclusion, the difference between being awake and asleep is your awareness to the presence and the nearness of God. The difference between being awake and a light is your availability. 
to be on mission for God. So what I'm trying to say is, if we want revival to break out, we have to be spiritually awake and prepared for it. Because a world that is fast asleep needs a church that's wide awake. It doesn't look like change, we can change the world in our own strength, but I think it's about being awake and aware of the Spirit of God and being available to be directed by the Spirit of God to the places in culture, the places in our own family, where there's a need for light, there's a need for salt, and maybe there's a need for an alarm clock. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So let's pray. Let's all our heads bowed. I just want to give an opportunity um, for a couple of groups. The first one is maybe you are a Christian, but your life doesn't look anything like a Christian's ought to look like. You've fallen so far away from God um, and you're wondering, can I come back home? And what I want to say to you is, God's arms are wide open. Come back home. You are welcome to come back home. And if that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand. Um, I would love to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. I see that hand. So just pray this prayer with me and maybe we can all pray this together just out loud. Father, I thank you that you are the only one who saves. God, I thank you that you're, you've been calling out to me <laughs> and I'm responding tonight and I'm coming back home. Lord, take my life Make it what it ought to be. Amen. Amen. And for this other group um, who are a Christian, and maybe there's areas of your life that are asleep. You've fallen asleep. You are not actively walking in the purposes and the plans that God has for you. God is here tonight. You didn't come by accident. And he's saying it's not too late. It's not too late. There's always a yes. For every morning, there's a yes. You can say yes to God. You can say yes to Jesus. You can say yes, I will walk in your paths and be obedient to you. You can say yes. So if that's you and you just wanna be, you wanna, you wanna awaken. Um, just slip your hand up as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. So I'll just pray. God, I thank you so much that you are a good and faithful God. God, that you are calling out to us. Even tonight, God, we hear you calling our name and, call, and shaking us awake and saying, wake up. Don't leave what I put in you unopened. So God, I thank you for every hand that's raised. God, they are, we are saying yes to you, Jesus, tonight. We are saying that we wanna be awake and alive to everything you've called us to be. God, we will not walk another day outside of your Holy Spirit. God, speak to us, speak to us even tonight. Holy Spirit, come by your power. Breathe on us, Ruch of God. We are waiting for you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. God, we cannot live a day without your spirit. Move us to the places that you have for us. God, those places that are asleep, God, I thank you that you're waking us up. You're waking us up to your presence. That, our, that you're making our, our hearts tender to your touch. 
You're making, you're opening our ears to hear your voice when you say, go this way, don't go that way. Stay here, go there, Jesus. And may we be quick to obey you. We love you, Jesus. We're so thankful for you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.